So uh, I hope you're all awake now. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry for this uh, sound spectacle. Um, I'm very glad to be here. To my, it's my second Scala I/O. The first one was, uh, I think, what was it? Three, year back, three years back in Paris. So uh, I'm not exactly sure anymore. Two years or three years back in Paris. Uh, it's uh, Paris is a beautiful city. So is Lyon. We had a great dinner yesterday at a Bouchon uh, chez Abdel. Alors, uh, I can really recommend that. So um, what uh, this talk is about is I wanted to give you a quick update where we are in the Scala space, in particular with something that I've been mostly working on, that's Dotty, the next generation compiler. And, uh, but also generally, I mean, where, where Scala is, what has happened in 2016. Uh, there's actually quite a few things that have happened. Uh, there's a new release which is, will hopefully definitely come out in 2016. It's currently in RC2, so release candidate number two. And with the, the RC system, is essentially whenever a release candidate is found to be reasonably bug-free that it can go in production, it will go in pro into production. So it could well, very well be that this is the last RC and that what's out there is uh, finally Scala 2.12. Um, since 2.12 is out, we uh, think the next step beyond 2.13 uh, will be on the topic rethinking the Scala libraries. Uh, can, is, are there useful reorganizations that we could do? Uh, what we've also seen in 2016 is a new target platform, uh, Scala Native, and uh, quite a lot of progress on Scala JS. Uh, then we have seen uh, the creation of the Scala Center, and finally, new results on DOT, the calculus underlying Scala, and DOTI. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those. Uh, Scala 2.12 uh, is, as I said, basically out. Uh, the uh, main aim of 2.12 is to make good use of the new capabilities in Java 8. So uh, 2.11 ran already on Java 8, of course. <clears throat> but it didn't really make use of the lambdas, uh, except for interop. So it could understand Java's lambdas, but it would, the compiler wouldn't generate any lambdas, uh, so it does now. And uh, it also generates uh, default methods of traits, uh, uh, so interfaces in Java. So that's also uh, an, uh, an advantage, because it can actually reduce your code size quite a bit. Uh, it's actually uh, often these things are not so uniformly better. So one bad surprise that the 212 team found was that when they switched to the fancy new uh, trade encoding using the default methods, the cold start performance went down 15 to 20 percent, 15 to 20 percent slower for the compiler itself. And any uh, essentially program that uses traits a lot would suffer from the from the same problem here. Uh, the problem was, or still is, that these default methods are just not optimized as aggressively as if you have an encoding in classes. Uh, so essentially, the, the JVM will get much later to optimize that me those methods than the traditional encoding, the clunky encoding we used before. And that's the, that, that caused the slowdown in cold start performance. So in a nutshell, uh, the, the team backed out on these methods a little bit. It still uses straight default methods for interop and for migration, but it also essentially uses the traditional scheme which just essentially patches these classes directly in order to get better cold start performance. I think that's configurable with the switch, so you might as well turn it around as well. Okay, uh, <laughs> Scala 2.11 will be around for a while. Uh, I think 2.11.9 is just out, and uh, hopefully that will be the last release, but it will be essentially uh, that uh, uh, will be maintained with, uh, if needs to be, point bug fixes for a while in the future. A lot of new features. Uh, look at the release notes to, to, to have them, uh, to see the details. And <clears throat> a lot of contributors uh, uh, from uh, Lightband Scala team, Lucas, Jason, Adrian, but also uh, from quite a few people outside. So that's a big step. Um, after 2.12, uh, the next logical successor is 2.13. And where 2.12 was basically mostly about the code generation compiler backend, uh, 2.13 will be mostly about the libraries. Uh, what we want to do is essentially two things. Uh, we want to have a first a look at collections. 
I think collections actually work pretty well. I mean, most Scala programmers grow up with collections and become co productive with collections very quickly. But, but there might be ways to make them, <coughs> how should I say, more elegant and <coughs> to um, avoid some of the uh, uh, things that made current collections very brittle and difficult to implement. Uh, one uh, problem in current collections is the integration of views or more generally lazy collections in general, uh, essentially collections that are not push-based. Uh, uh, there are views, but they are sort of a lot of people say don't use views because there's some performance surprises and things like that. And it's true, so that's something that uh, with a redesign of the architecture of collections we might be able to address. Um, other uh, possible directions are uh, one very, very successful uh, uh, incarnation of uh, Scala's collection is Spark, of course. So Spark looks very much like Scala collections, uh, but it has some additional methods, uh, in particular when it comes to pairs, uh, which would be very useful to, to use. So essentially the, the, that one can be more fluent in uh, treating a list of pairs as a map from one uh, uh, element of the pair to the other. Uh, those methods, uh, like reduce by key, to give you an example, would be probably good to have in the main line. Um, the current status is that we have uh, several Strawman proposals. We are uh, converging on one, uh, which is still a Strawman, but that's the one we want to further uh, uh, elaborate. Uh, it's currently about a thousand lines of uh, example code in the libraries, uh, and it is very, actually, in the end, pretty close to what we have so far. So, from a usage perspective, it shouldn't change anything. From an implementation perspective, if you're in the business of writing your own collection types, there might be some adaptations that you need to do, and it doesn't have can build from. So, that's uh, I think uh, a big a big advantage not to have can build from. And it has a very nice integration with views, <coughs> in particular that, <coughs> that every collection, uh, essentially views are the cornerstone of, of collections now. So essentially every collection is defined by its view. Okay, uh, we want to push that further and we are also still looking at other possibilities. So if you have another cool possibility to propose for collections, it would be very good to, to look at these things. It's just that I think the, the fact of the matter is that we're under very, very severe compatibility constraints. So we really, this idea that to say, well, for a user of the collection, nothing should change except for very peculiar usage patterns, uh, that I think is something we have subscribed to. So we won't actually throw out collections and put something in there because there's just too much code and also too, too, too many good experiences with collections that we will not throw overboard. Uh, the other thing that we are starting to think about for the next cycle is a modernization of the libraries. So uh, the Scala standard library is somewhat of a strange beast. Uh, there was a phase in the mid 2000s uh, where essentially we took everything that came because there was very little code out there. So if you had a cool idea for any, anything collection or parser combinator or whatever like, uh, it just ended up in the standard collection because, well, uh, we did, there was no code out there. And now, um, eight years later or something like that, we are stuck with a library which is sort of very, has very diff different use patterns. Some part is extremely heavily used, like collections. Other parts are hardly used at all, or sometimes uh, there are a lot of other alternatives available. Uh, i give you an example. Parser combinators, I think they're quite beautiful, but they're definitely not the fastest implementation of parser combinators out there. There are much better solutions if, you, if it's speed that you want. So why should the standard library essentially uh, uh, prioritize one implementation which might not even be the best implementation. So what we're trying to do is uh, to modernize this a little bit better to maybe split the Scala standard library into a core and a Scala platform. So the core should be essentially something that basically everybody uses uh, and also the core needs to have everything that the Scala compiler uses because the Scala compiler will depend on core and nothing else. So essentially, if something is used by a Scala compiler, it has to be in core. If something is used by basically every Scala programmer out there, it would be crazy not to put it in core. Uh, 
But for all the rest, uh, we should maybe uh, use, not put that in the so-called standard library. Then the question is, where else do you put it? Um, there's a possibility to, to essentially just tell the users, well, discover this stuff yourself, and we're going to help you. There's this uh, Scala, Scala Dex, the Scala package index out there that helps you find uh, what uh, packages for whatever you need. But I think there's actually scope for something a little bit more battery included approach, and uh, that would be the Scala platform. So Scala platform is essentially something that would, should be curated by the community, by a team of people working on the platform, and the Scala platform would probably be have best of breed solutions in a number of areas, uh, and it should these areas should probably be bigger than what's currently in the standard library. So a typical thing that I would like to see in the Scala platform is a library not just for XML, which will surely go to platform. It has no, no use being in the standard library, but also for JSON. So it's actually JSON parsers. Uh, uh, lots of other things could go into the platform. Uh, the, and the, to be successful in this platform, uh, the most important thing is that it's a community effort, that really we find a set of people who says, well, that's something we care about and I want to contribute uh, my library and I will commit to maintain it with other people and uh, I will essentially work with others in the platform to uh, throw together, or to, or not just throw together, but to build something that works well with each other. So, uh, for instance, if one, um, uh, the uh, dependencies in the platform ideally should go only to the platform. So if one library uses something else, then that something else should either be a very well-known external library that we don't need to duplicate, or it should be in the platform. But the dependencies shouldn't just go all over the place. Okay, so that's the second thing, and that's sort of something that we want to essentially start a process. I don't have a platform yet, but I think what we should do is start a process to get to the platform. Uh, then uh, there's development in the non-traditional targets. Uh, Scala.js is now at 0.6.13. Uh, uh, it has tuples, it has better JUnit support, it has better uh, uh, JavaScript support through native anonymous classes, and it has faster code generation. And generally, Scala.js is now, I think even though it's 0.6, uh, the next release, well, people always say next release, but hopefully really one of the very soon next releases will be 1.0, which means that we finally, uh, the team finally acknowledges that this thing is production ready. I would say it's production ready now, but the people are very, very conservative, so they just want to get, fix this, fix this, fix this, maybe also uh, because once you are 1.0, it's m much, much harder to change any API. Okay, uh, the other thing is much more, uh, uh, in the early stages, that's uh, Scala native, uh, which is essentially Scala on LLVM. Uh, it's, um, uh, it, it, it works uh, to some degree, uh, so you can, you, can, you can compile programs with Scala native. The current effort, which is also well underway, is to essentially come up with a reasonable library that supports it. So essentially it works, so the first Scala native programs had to use a sort of C-like interface for print, uh, printf uh, because, uh, of course, the, a, an input-output library like Java was not available on an LLVM. So what people are doing now, and with a lot of uh, help from the community, which is great, is that they take uh, a Java uh, code, mostly Harmony Java code, which is a free, uh, has a free license, and essentially translate the Java code to Scala, so to have essentially, uh, so that it can be compiled under Scala native, and with that we can actually build essentially a, a reasonable initial step at the standard functionality that, that programs would need on the Scala native platform. That's, that's the current state there. And then uh, the other big news is that uh, we now have a new steward for Scala, which is uh, the Scala Center. So that was big news that came out in uh, about May this year. Uh, Scala Center has two uh, missions. Uh, the first mission is education. So it wants to provide high quality uh, education with free access. And that's done mostly via MOOCs, uh, multi massive open online courses. 
there are now uh, three MOOCs out. Uh, two MOOCs are uh, essentially functional programming principles. Uh, second one is functional programming program design, which is essentially the second part of the first course that we gave that maybe a lot of you had seen, and uh, mixed with the with the uh, with some parts from the reactive course. Uh, then there's a course on parallel programming and uh, parallel collections. And finally, there will be a course real soon now on Spark. So essentially, that's the current uh, development. And uh, those four courses, they make up a specialization in Coursera, which is actually among the most successful specializations that they run. And it will be complemented by a capstone project. Uh, the second main uh, purpose of the Scala Center, or equally important as the education, is open source stewardship. So what the Scala Center wants to do is essentially open source work that profits from uh, somebody doing it, and that's typically cross-cutting. That means everybody profits. So one of the first things the Scala Center did was precisely uh, Scala Dex, a package index that essentially allows everyone to discover the libraries and packages that might be useful for their applications from other, from other, um, uh, from other uh, open source uh, uh, authors. Uh, another thing that Scala Center has been started to do is look at Scala.js libraries to essentially continue the effort to bring Scala.js forward because Scala.js doesn't really have a corporate sponsor. Uh, it's uh, a project that's done by uh, essentially a student and so far uh, one engineer at DPFL. So, uh, and it's quite actually quite amazing what they, the two were able to, to achieve. Uh, but I think to bring this forward, we need uh, some continued help and Scala Center is doing that. And it's doing several other projects as well. Uh, it's quite open to which projects it should do uh, because the, the, the way that works is that it, uh, ha it has an advisory board that's uh, made up from sponsoring companies. So those companies essentially finance the open source work of the Scala Center. The Scala Center is not financed by EPFL. Well, there was some startup funding, but the expectation from next year on is that the center will be self-sufficient. So it relies on the contributions of these companies, and there might be several more coming. And uh, a great thanks to the companies to put in so much uh, support for the open source work. So we have advisory board meetings where delegates from these companies meet, and also community representatives meet. One uh, community representative is uh, Bill Venners, who's here at the conference. And uh, the second one will probably be Lars Huppel, remains to be confirmed in the next meeting. Uh, that was essentially the representative that the type level project proposed. So if you have a great idea what the Scala Center should be doing and what can be reasonably done with the resources and typically, ideally, what involves the community, so it's essentially work that crystallizes some useful community work, then. Uh, if you see Bill Venice around, talk to him. He's the uh, community representative who can then propose this thing to the next meeting of the advisory board. Okay. Um, the people in the Scala Center currently are Heather Milner. Oops, that was a typo. Sorry, it was late last night when I wrote this. Uh, uh, Julien Richard Foy, uh, Guillaume Massé, and Jorge Vincente uh, Cantero. And they're hiring, so there are more positions available. Uh, in particular, I think uh, the two positions that are in need of being fill filled urgently is somebody to look at the general thing of essentially public uh, presentations, uh, documentation, talks, uh, co community communication. So that's one one big job. And uh, we are also looking at strengthening the management part of the center. So if you know of somebody who might be interested in doing that and who would not mind uh, living for a while in beautiful Switzerland, more precisely Lausanne on the uh, Lake Geneva, then, uh, then tell me or tell them or tell Heather uh, the, the Scala Center's direction. OK. So one thing the Scala Center is also charged doing, and that was actually two companies mostly, Goldman Sachs and Verizon, who was, were insisting on this. One of their projects is to work on a migration tool from 
Scala to uh, Scala C, uh, the current Scala 2.x, which saves here is 2 dotty. So the hopefully uh, next version of the technology and the compiler. The first version of that uh, that tool just came out. It's very very small at the at the moment. It essentially just does just two things. The tool is called Scala Fix, uh, and it's been written by Olaf Gerson, uh, who is essentially one of the people who uh, actually. I missed him on that list, yeah. He should be on that list because he's employed by Scala Center. Olaf Gerson, number five. Okay, so that brings me to Dotty. So what's this tool about that, you, uh, that helps you migrate? Uh, where, where does it help you migrate to? So Dotty is, the name Dotty comes from uh, dot, and dot is uh, an abbreviation for uh, dependent object uh, uh, types. So essentially a calculus, a mini language that talks about objects with dependent types. Dependent types uh, means particularly that essentially in this case objects can contain types themselves. So if you refer to a type like x.t, that's a dependent type because the x, that's a reference to some object, is in the type. Right? So, uh, and Scala always had these dependent types, of course, from day one. Uh, but uh, the, a good foundation was lacking. Uh, there are type theories for dependent types. They are essentially typically versions of lambda calculus that have these dependent types. But essentially, in particular, the object system of Scala is quite, quite a bit removed from what you could express in lambda calculus. So while it's technically possible to explain these things into a calculus that exists, typically the, the effort of translation is very very high, and the result of the translation is quite unintuitive. So it, one must ask themselves why use a new calculus, why use essentially this calculus uh, if it doesn't explain much of the source language. So we wanted something more direct, and uh, that was the, the, we had a candidate for a long time, that was DOT, and uh, we, uh, it was surprisingly hard to prove this calculus correct, I'm going to tell you a little bit more what that means. Uh, in fact, that it took us eight years to prove it correct. Uh, but now that it's proven correct, it actually has given us already a lots and lots of insights about language design, about what to do, also about what not to do, because it's probably unsound or it's very, very hard to get right. OK, so DOT, the, the, like I said, it's a mini language uh, that can, one can reason formally about. And in fact, the language is just so small that it fits on this one slide. Uh, if I exclude the types, the types will fit on another slide. So what the language, all these things are recognizably Scala, right? So they're just essentially little Scala snippets. And the idea is that I can, the programs and the calculus, the terms and the calculus uh, are composed from these uh, grammar rules. So what do we have? We have. Um, uh, anonymous functions, that's the first thing. We have, in this case, uh, anonymous objects, uh, that's the second thing, so no classes in this calculus. We have parameterless methods, so uh, we have type definitions, and then in the, in the expressions we have, well, these two values here, anonymous functions and objects. We have variables, of course. We have function application. Uh, we have uh, method selection, parameterless method selection, and we have local definitions. So essentially a block with a vowel and, and an expression. And that's all. So that's essentially what we're talking about. And one of the things one has to reason about then is to say, well, is that enough? Can I really essentially map the full language into that? And the answer is, well, it's actually, uh, it's not the full language, but it's a surprisingly large subset of the language that I can map into that quite straightforwardly. Particularly, what I can map into that is all forms of parameterization, so type parameters. Uh, classes uh, take, uh, I can also map with, if I'm willing to live with a little bit of code duplication. There's currently a project underway to essentially extend this calculus to something with classes and inheritance to essentially be able to represent that a little bit more directly. But um, that larger version, uh, useful as it is, won't replace the minimal one. There's, a, there's, a, there's an, uh, a, a big value in minimality because that's the, the smaller your calculus is, the easier it is for other people to build on it. 
OK, I haven't shown you the types yet, so let's have a look at those. So uh, there's a top type, there's a bottom type, any and nothing. So we know those as the, as the type selection, x.a, where a is the name of a type. So that, those are these path-dependent types. Uh, there are function types, um, uh, and here the function type is actually more powerful. It's a dependent function type. Uh, so uh, in particular, the, uh, you, you know you can have methods where the result type of the method depends on the parameter x. So those are called dependent methods. Uh, and, uh, uh, those, ex those we have in Scala for a while already, but the question is, should I lift this to the type level? Should I be able to talk about a type, the type of all functions that map, let's say, x, dot a, x to x dot a, something like that, x, x, or x dot a to x dot b. Uh, so should I be able to talk about that? And uh, currently in Scala, that's not the case. But it turns out in the calculus that we, it was the, by far the most elegant and simple way to express certain things, to push that into the type. So if when things are like that, that the calculus tells you, well, there's a simple and elegant way to, to put things that way, then uh, typically one should listen and says, well, maybe that's a simple and elegant way in the language as well in the calculus. So that's something we're currently sort of pondering. Should Scala get full dependent function types, so not just the the uh, function types we have that cannot essentially refer to the argument types. OK. Then we have essentially super simple structural types, uh, uh, method declaration, type declaration, those we have, but we typically build them up with refinements, right? So we, we build, put several to them. Uh, in the calculus, we don't have refinements, but we have something else. We have intersection. So we can intersect two types, and thereby we can essentially build up these single field records into records with, with many more types. Intersection exists sort of in Scala. It's called width. So currently T1 with T2. But uh, I'll get to that. It's actually not exactly the same thing. So width has certain shortcomings, in particular, that it's not commutative. So A with B is not the same as B with A in general. Uh, but for with intersection, it is. So essentially, the proposal is to de deprecate width or rewrite width automatically and use the new intersection operator instead. And the final thing is recursion, which is essentially exists on the class level in Scala, not on the, on the type level. It exists with a, not with this syntax, but with an indirect syntax, because refinements can essentially recursively map to each other. In the calculus, it was important to make this a special construct, because when it, it's easier to, if you talk about things formally that you have some syntax to hang this on. OK. So the, the hard part of the proof was uh, the, the, this uh, property, which says that if a term has a type and evaluation of the term terminates, then the result will be a value of the same type. That's typically called a type soundness theorem or the classical uh, uh, um, uh, characterization of a type soundness theorem. And uh, I'm, you, can, you can ask me after the talk why it was so hard. Uh, but uh, it was very hard. It, well, it was mostly because users can write these types with lower and upper bounds, and essentially that means that uh, in this language and calculus, essentially the subtype theory is user definable. And that's something that makes a lot of calculus people and mathematicians very nervous that you say, well, I, I want, really want to know what theory I I'm talking about. But with user defined subtype, uh, essentially type declarations, that's not the case. And that made essentially the soundness proofs much, much harder. So why is it important to have a theorem about that, like that? Well, one is it gives us a validation. We're on the right track. This seems to be a good calculus for what we're talking about. But why is a calculus important, you could ask? Well, I, I think the, the importance here is it gives us a technique to reason about the correctness of other language features. And it turns out that um, uh, we now have put a, quite a few language features under scrutiny, and they probably will have to go. So the lesson learned from the calculus was that essentially this one on the top. So if you select a type from a value like x dot t or something like that, or path dot t, then uh, the path x must be known to be a constructed value. 
Because if you construct this thing at runtime, you know that essentially all the types you define have actually a solution. You have to give concrete types when you run this. Or uh, uh, if, if, if there's still an abstract type, then the compiler at this point will check that all the bounds are OK. But it turns out it can't do that in general. It can only do that when you build an object. So that means to turn out to, to, to be sure that you don't get into contradictions with the bounds and things like that, every prefix of a type selection must be a constructed value in the end. Uh, so that's the soundness principle that we have to follow from now on in Scala because we have found with numerous uh, numerous counterexamples, uh, most of them done by Nada Amin, uh, that essentially everything else is, is hopeless. So there's just too many ways to compose these things uh, in surprising ways to get into inconsistent theories. Okay. So what does that mean? So things that have to go, the things that are very problematic are general type projection, A hash B. Uh, because, well, we don't know whether the A here is actually uh, a type that is consistent, that has consistent bounds. And in general, we can't find out whether it has that. So there are subsets of this thing that we can still allow. And uh, the, the, the one that essentially is uh, is uh, unproblematic is the idea that we can select from just classes, Java classes or some classes, an inner class. That's what's actually the, the first motivation for this hash. But uh, the, the unrestricted usage that you find in many of the type level uh, computations that essentially do uh, SK combinators, so the, uh, the original uh, proof, uh, demonstration that Scala is Turing complete used these things. So that actually used, used these things in a way which in general is unsound. Not in this example, but it uses essentially techniques which have known uh, soundness problems. So they will probably have to go. Uh, the other thing that uh, has to go for the same reason is now as an inhabitant of all types. Because if you write x dot t, then well, x might be now somewhere. And when you write null, then uh, you, you, you don't have any proof in your hand that the type of this null, which could be any type, has consistent bounds. So uh, for, for the soundness alone, we have to invest in essentially null safe type systems. And the third one is uh, uninitialized values, because that's just another way to get null, right? If you have an uninitialized value, it's null, and that means it hasn't been constructed, so taking the type from something like that is, uh, again, very problematic. So we'll have to look at how to track uninitial, uninitialized values in the type system, which has another, if we can pull it off, it will have another big advantage because I think a lot of the puzzling bugs in Scala have to do with uninitialized values. So it would be very, very nice if we would have a type system that could, could track these things. Okay. So that brings me now to Dotty. So Dotty is the working name for our new Scala compiler, which builds on Dot in its internal data structure. So a lot of the things is closely modeled after what we have in the calculus. Uh, in particular, uh, generics get expressed as type members, just like they are in the cal calculus. And uh, Dotty is also the code base, which should make it easy to support the evolution of the Scala programming language. And to some degree, it has already done that. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what we currently have in Dotty and what our plans are. So the compiler is uh, about, about two thirds the size of the current Scala compiler. But as these things go, it will probably grow uh, the more contributors we have. It's very functional. Uh, that means that Unlike the traditional Scala C, which was mostly functional, this is almost everywhere functional, uh, at, at least as far as the interfaces go. So uh, the trees are immutable, types are immutable. Essentially, all, everything we could make immutable is immutable in this calculus. Uh, it uses a lot of very clever imperative techniques under the hood, uh, mostly having to do with caching to, to be very, very fast. It, uh, uh, because I mean functional code, as we all know, if you uh, typically there's, it won't speed up things if you become very functional. Uh, so there's a certain performance penalty to be paid for abstraction. So to counter that, it uses very, very uh, aggressive caching, which uh, you can do when you're very functional. So in a sense, it's sort of a trade-off. If you're more functional, then uh, you, you, you have more liberty to cache because 
the, all, as we all know, cache invalidation is one of the hardest problems in computer science, and uh, cache invalidation gets the harder, the more things can change. So if things basically cannot change, if it's just memorization or fancy uh, forms of memorization, then caching pays off big. And that means that, the, yes, even though it is very functional, the compiler is actually faster than uh, the current Scala C, which is uh, the internal code name is NSC for that one. Uh, and um, we are currently at maybe about twice the speed. It's hard to say. It depends on the programs that we compile. And we have hopes that we can improve that significantly in the future. So the architecture of the DOTI compiler is um, essentially like this. So if we compare it to NSC, it's actually quite similar. So both take Scala sources uh, and produce an AST, an abstract syntax tree. Uh, the ISTs are roughly comparable. That means they, have, they talk about the same sorts of nodes. Uh, no surprise, because the nodes correspond to language constructs in Scala. And it's the same language. But uh, the ASTs here are immutable, whereas those were mutable. And furthermore, uh, the, the big thing that changes is that these ASTs have a serialized representation called tasty type abstract syntax trees. Um, so that means that we can actually put these, the, the full AST, the full typed AST, into uh, a compiled class file and uh, use that essentially as a symbol information. So previously we put a symbol information so that one compilation unit could figure out what the, other, what the API of the other compilation unit was, what methods it offered, what classes, and things like that. Uh, that was necessary because, of course, the Java bytecodes only give you the Java view of things, uh, and we needed to add other information to give you the Scala view of things. Um, now we have much more. We have the complete program, the complete typed ab abstract syntax tree in these uh, class files. Uh, the first thing which is a, was a pleasant surprise is that these typed abstract syntax trees, they're actually quite compact, um, roughly on the order of the source size. So I thought it would be much, much bigger and would blow up the, the jars and the class files, but it doesn't. So it's, it's actually quite reasonable what it does there. Um, the, the other big thing is that that gives you now, I think, a lot of leverage for lots of tools. So, Imagine you have the complete result of the compilation, all the types, all the positions, all the trees everywhere in a serialized form. You can just pull it out. You can essentially get the source uh, <clears throat> and get all the information you need about the source. So everything the typer knows is in the tasty tree. So imagine what you could do th with that in tools. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, scope for essentially static analysis tools. Uh, we we're going to use this thing into, in the new IDE uh, interface because essentially if you want to do find references or rename, that's precisely what you need. You just have to go through all the trees and says, well, where do I have the references to the symbol? And it tells me that if the positions are correct, it will just tell me exactly in the source where all the references are, and so on and so on. So that's, that's a big vision that I think this tasty thing will be very, very central for a lot of things we're going to do. <coughs> The uh, Tasty is also the basis of a very aggressive and ambitious whole program optimizer that uh, will essentially take, uh, take, take the program and do very aggressive inlining and dead code elimination and so on. <clears throat> so then we have a bunch of transforms, um, many more than NSC because the transforms are essentially better modularized. Every transform does one thing and uh, one thing only. Uh, we get to a simplified AST which is essentially something that could be mapped very easily back into pre-generic Java, uh, or as it happens, pre-generic Java is also very close to Java bytecodes. So then we just need a code, uh, code generation um, <coughs> uh, layer and go into class files. The code generation layer is currently shared between the Scala part, the Scala C part, and, and the dirty part. So we use the same code generator here. <clears throat> okay, so one thing Dotty um, is supposed to support is evolving the language. And uh, that's, of course, <clears throat> being a language designer, something I care much about. So <clears throat> uh, it's quite natural that I want to make Scala the best programming language I know how to make. And best here is 
definitely not something absolute. So it definitely will not mean throw lots of features and features into Scala to, do, to, to be the best language for everyone. So you have to select something. And you also have to say, well, something is worthwhile doing. But it just doesn't fit very well. So uh, what best means here is essentially a local optimum that you say, well, if in the space Scala is, uh, which is uh, essentially general purpose, predominantly functional programming, uh, I want, to, and on the JVM with essentially strong interoperability with something like Java, uh, if there's something we can improve, we should. So that's sort of my, my idea. But we won't turn it into something completely different, like uh, a, a TypeScript, uh, JS only, or a Haskell, or something like that. OK. So the elements we play with, which I think are the essential elements for Scala, are definitely the functions. And I think we should take functions more seriously. That means functions should be mathematical functions, and there should be ways to actually ensure that. Uh, classes and objects, uh, which are essentially the module system. So we have uh, essentially standardized on that as, as our module system. And I think by and large, it was a good decision. Uh, strictness. Uh, so there, we all know there are ways to write lazy Scala programs, but they are not essentially the default, and they will not become the default. Uh, local type inference, uh, which is essentially a trade-off. It would, of course, be nice to have full Hindley-Milner. Uh, but unfortunately, that ju that's just not compatible with a lot of the features that are in Scala, in particular, the heavy reliance on subtyping. So it will stay local type inference, but we'll see what we can improve there. And finally, and I think that's very important, implicit, and, and with that I mean more implicit parameters and uh, used to simulate, for instance, type classes and not so much implicit conversions. And I think implicits are really where it's at. So I, I really think that's the thing that got pioneered by Scala, and that is an extremely powerful feature, an easily misused feature, and we just essentially have to uh, turn the dials to make it to improve the usability and improve the uh, essentially general uh, application areas. And I, believe me, there are lots and lots of more application areas for implicit that we only scratch the surface at and essentially reduce the, uh, the abilities to the, 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 the scope of misuse. So that's, I think, an important thing where we say we have, we have sort of a rough diamond there, and we have to polish it more to make it really shine. So the goal, what, the goal for the new development is to deepen the synthesis of functional and modular programming uh, to improve the connection of Scala with the theoretical foundations, DOT specifically, uh, to improve the guarantees that the type system can give us, and at the same time to stay simple and approachable. So I'll give you a quick whirlwind tour of uh, what we have. Well, first, let's, let me start with what we have no more, or what we will drop. Uh, so I said, well, what, we, we're not going to make a huge language where we drop lots of things. So we will add some of the things. So what we want to do is essentially drop some of the things before we start adding them. Uh, some of the things are purely syntactic, like procedure syntax will be rewritten automatically to, sorry, to oops, the thing that you see here at the bottom. So the uh, Scala fix rewrite tool does that already. Uh, there was this fairly obscure thing like delayed in it, which will be dropped uh, early initial, uh, sorry, mac macros. The current macro kind uh, will not be supported by Dotty, but there will be a replacement. I'm going to get to that. Um, Early initializers, uh, probably, who, who knows about early initial? Who has used early initializers already? OK, yeah, so uh, sometimes there's just no other way. You need them, right? So there's no way around them, but they are a very complicated feature. So you have to, um, so we, uh, in Dotty, we have actually something called trait parameters. And with trait parameters, essentially, you, uh, there's no more useful use case for any early initializers. So we can drop them. Existential types. Um, Wildcards are still supported, and I mentioned already general type uh, type projection because that was found to be unsound. <clears throat> okay, so if we look at the new features that we're going to implement, I mentioned already intersection types, uh, a commutative version of T with U. Uh, that's implemented. Uh, union types, uh, T or U. Uh, 
that's uh, in particular very useful to avoid essentially this explosion in an if then else if you have some types that sort of are in a weird interference with each other and sometimes the least upper bounds of these types will just fill multiple pages well you have to you have to work at it but by now uh, we know a lot of tricks to get it to multiple pages in the type output so that will go away because in the future the type of an if then else is just the type of the left branch or the type of the uh, of the right branch and that's it no ma no more magic there so that's implemented um, function arity adaptation so that means that it's essentially the reverse of auto tuppling it means that if you want um, a oops uh, if you want to, if, let's say you have a pair and you want a function, a function, map a function over the pairs, then right now the best way to do that is with a case, a case and a pattern match. And that's kind of weird, in, in particular for newcomers. So in the future we'll let you write just map x, y, and then the thing. So essentially the compiler can figure out itself himself that what you get is a list of pairs and that therefore this thing is, should be desugared in a, in a pair type. That's also implemented. Trade parameters, so traits now can have normal parameters like classes. Uh, static methods and fields, mostly for Java interrupt because some, uh, like Java persistence and others just require you to do certain static declarations, so we have to make sure that this thing actually is static. Uh, Non-blocking lazy vowels, uh, so uh, there's a new scheme for lazy vowels, which is essentially SIP20, so Scala in the Scala improvement process, which has also been proposed for Scala C. Uh, that's implemented in Dottie, but the difference is, uh, the other difference is that in the future, by default, lazy vowels don't lock. So essentially, they're thread local, they're assumed to be thread local, which means they will be much, much faster because locking is expensive. So if you use lazy vowels a lot, then people sometimes shy away from them because they said, well, it's too expensive. There are all these synchronized and, and, and locking, locking statements that I have to do. So in the future, if you want lazy vowels that are visible from several threads and uh, they should behave, behave in the right way, you have to write a volatile in front of it. Uh, and again, the rewrite tool that we, uh, we uh, have in Dottie will uh, do that automatically for you. It will just put by defensively a volatile in front of every lazy vowel you write, so uh, this, the syntax won't change. Uh, but then it's up to you to say, well, no, I really want performance and this thing is thread local, so let's, let's drop the volatile. Okay, and then we have a type safe version of equals and not equals, multiversal equality. It was quite a big discussion uh, when, the, when that came out earlier this year. So all these things are currently implemented already in .eu. If you use .eu, you can use them right away. <coughs> so motivation everywhere was better foundations, easier, safer to use, and more orthogonal. Okay, um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to uh, skip a lot of things. Uh, uh, what, what we have here is essentially improvements in the type system in the type inference should be simpler to specify in the implicit search with the faster search algorithms and several improvements in value classes. So who's working on, on all this? So the core team is at EPFL, including Dimitri Petrashko, Kujo Matres, Felix Mulder, and new, come, new people who've newly joined us is Nicolas Stucki, Feng Yong Liu, and Olivier Blanc-Villain. And we also have a, a rapidly increasing set of outside contributors. In particular, there's now a drive to essentially make error messages nice in the, in the, in the Elm way of nice, so really to have nice, nice explanations and things like that. And essentially, we crowdsource that, so a lot of new contributors come and say, well, make, let me make this error message nicer. Let, let me make, give an explanation for that error message. So if you have some time on, on your hands and want to join that, I think some messages are still left, but they're going quickly. Um, the Scala Lightband team also helped a lot with uh, providing the infrastructure, doing reviews of what we do and suggestions. So the next step would be uh, to go to a minimal viable product for Dottie. Minimal viable product is something where we essentially say with confidence, well, here's a release, you should be able to use that. It's not a production ready release uh, because we reserve the right to essentially change things and break things for a while. Uh, uh, but uh, if you want to uh, 
uh, try it out and see what's coming and or if you want to contribute or if you want to essentially just play with it, it should be, we, we, we are confident that you won't be disappointed. And uh, so that means we need to be able to use large projects and libraries and also migrate them. So not just use the Scala 2 binaries, which we can, but migrate those, those large projects and libraries. And the second uh, milestone there is that one should be able to work only in the DOTI code base. So no Scala C needed anywhere, not for the REPL, not for the IDEs. It means we need a lot of these things to, to replace a lot of these things ourselves. We hope to get there in spring 2017. That's difficult to say because we're not like an, a big company that says, well, that's our milestone, let's throw programmers at it. It's a community effort. It depends how essentially people uh, can, how many, how, how how good uh, contributions we get and how focused and motivated the contributors are. So needed for the MVP is the following. We need a stable compiler, and we're getting there, I think. We need build tool integration, and that's done for SPT. And uh, we are also working with Chris Fork on uh, CBT integration, which could be a very nice alternative build tool for Dutty. Uh, we need a wrapper. We currently have a really simple rudimentary one that could, could need some love if, if somebody wants to sort of uh, take over work or contribute to work for the wrapper would be great. We need IDE integration and we're talking with the Ensign people and we're also talking with the IntelliJ people about that. So lots of things are happening there. One thing we have took on uh, now in the, in the Dotty team at EPFL is that we want to implement the VS Code language server protocol, which is used for uh, VS Code, also for Eclipse Chai, and it's made quite a, quite a essentially, it's qu got quite a lot of publicity recently as essentially an, a neutral API between a language IDE server and essentially editors that can use the, the protocol. So that's where we're currently about to implement that, and that protocol makes crucial use of precisely tasty trees for a lot of the information. We need a migration tool to be able to migrate large code bases to new things. So we have a first version, but it's very, very small, so lots more things need to be done. We need a community build where we have a set of libraries that can already be ported. Uh, first libraries are ported, more to come. And uh, we need docs, and there uh, we haven't really made an effort yet. Uh, so that's, that's definitely something that needs to be, uh, that, that essentially has to be undertaken in future. Okay, um, further down the road, and then we, then, we, then we close. So planned in future releases, I said macros will, are out. Macros will be replaced by Scala Meta. Uh, there's already been lots of talks about Meta, so I can be brief. Uh, essentially what we want to do is split the macros into two concepts, an inlining thing that you say I have a piece of code and I have a type of guaranteed way to plant this code at the call site. That's been implemented and a meta way, so um, meta essentially says, well, let me interpret all, everything on the meta level. So if I give you an argument uh, and I'm in a meta block, then I will see this argument not as a value at runtime, but as a tree at compile time. So that's the, 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 the meta proposal. Uh, it will hopefully make the macro system simpler and more orthogonal because in particular inlining and meta programming, they're really two orthogonal concepts. So the status is inline is implemented and meta is being worked on by Eugene Bomako, Feng Yun Yu and Olaf Gerson. Then uh, the next thing is implicit function types, uh, which is uh, uh, just means that you can write now an implicit closure uh, as a value, uh, but you can't write uh, in a function type, you can't say that the uh, argument should be implicit. And it turns out that if you have that, then it gives you finally the ability to allow abstraction over implicit parameters, which makes, will make them exponentially more useful than before. Uh, the next very ambitious thing is to work on an effect system. So we had a paper out at uh, the workshop on effects at the ICFP, at the International Function Programming Conference, and uh, that remains to be implemented. But I think that would be, if it's implemented, would be sort of the biggest, the biggest 
jump ahead for Scala and again the effort is to implement it in a backwards compatible way but I think we've, ju we've found just the ticket to do that so with this proposal uh, hopefully we can actually give you a smooth migration path from current Scala to effect checked, checked Scala that you can everybody can do that at their own pace essentially be able to effect check larger and larger libraries uh, so that, that's, that's an, of course, a must for, for this. But I think we, we found a way to do that. Null safety, I've already talked about. So null safety is necessary for soundness. And it's actually quite easy once you have union types because a type of essentially, the idea would be if you have just the type string, then null is no longer allowed. But if, if you have the type, type, type string question mark, then that would be string or null. And that can be represented quite easily in the type system just with a union type. It's, string or null. So that's, that's what it is here. And finally, uh, scrap your boilerplate. So what we want to do is essentially get rid of the 22s in Scala. I like 22 as a number, but uh, it's, it's been, been used a little bit too, too, too much in Scala. So uh, the, the idea there is that instead of having all these classes, tuple, product, function, we have essentially age lists in the language. Uh, and the syntax for age lists would be uh, just the syntax for tuples, right? So essentially an age list of length three would be written STU, and that would be interpreted as essentially be syntactic sugar for this thing on the right. So essentially integrate age lists with tuples, and then uh, based on that, we should also be able to abstract our case classes, essentially take, uh, you could say, the core of shapeless or some, some of the nice parts of shapeless and essentially integrate them with the compiler. So work on that has started. That's uh, Olivier Blanc-Villain who's, who's doing that. And he's actually also talking later at this conference. OK. So uh, that's all I had. Uh, thanks for listening. And I don't know whether we have time for questions or we should take it offline. Five minutes, OK. okay. Yes. I, uh, I'm. Is it working? I will shout. <laughs> yeah. I, so there is currently a big effort in mathematical work in Unity called the Unity Model Foundation of Mathematics. And I'm really impressed by the process of the health course. And it's interesting. Mm -hmm. You will see your ideas with your ideas intersecting. Are you going maybe to merge? I think that would be uh, really cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. So one thing, uh, they, they're actually quite far removed from each other. So what, what we care about, I mean, uh, or which also means they're actually quite compatible with each other. So Univellum Foundations is essentially to have a more systematic treatment of equality, which is sort of always used to be sort of always taken. Well, of course, we know what equals is. And Univellum Foundations is, is, starts with admitting, no, we don't know what equals is, so we essentially have to axiomatize that. And that's actually much, much more subtle than, than it first lo looks. So that sort of is, looks to be much more on the foundational level. And it could be added to what we do in f probably fairly reasonable ways. But uh, we haven't really worked on that yet. Oh, yeah. That, that's right. So can, can we get Scala to sort of be a language that sort of supports more automatic proof checking? Um, that's actually something that we are working on uh, strictly on the research side for the moment, I would say. There's a project uh, with, a, with, a, with a PhD student to, um, uh, you might have heard of the Leon proof checker uh, for, for Scala. So Leon is essentially uses an SMT solver to, uh, to, to have essentially statically verified contracts. And uh, uh, there's a way to actually also do this interactively or essentially using programming that the programmer could write these proofs. Uh, one very good example of that is a language called F star. Uh, F star is sort of like cock, but it's not an incremental theorem, uh, inter, uh, interactive theorem prover. It's really a programming language where you write these proofs essentially as part of your programs. So 
one idea would be integrate Leon and Scala, and that would be something probably a little bit similar to F star, which is this itself sort of a programmatic version of, of COC, you could say. Okay. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup pour cette keynote. Euh, on va comment dire, enchaîner euh, les talks. Euh, normalement, il y avait une, pro, une pause de un quart d'heure qui était prévue, enfin 10 minutes. On va la décaler un peu dans le temps pour euh, commencer directement les talks. Donc vous pouvez vous rendre dans les salles. Euh, les talks vont démarrer. Euh